Okay, this is concept one notes for our evolution unit, and we are going to be diving into just the absolute basics with principles of natural selection. So I really want you, wherever you're coming to this unit, mentally, whatever background knowledge you have, I just want you to take all of this in um, and really try to change your thinking and understanding. Because I found in my years as a teacher that so many of us have really um, misconstrued understandings of what evolution is. And I really, really hope to just give you the evidence and to make it really clear for you throughout this unit. So evolution, this is the definition of it. It is the process of biological change in populations over time that makes descendants genetically different from their ancestors. So all of that to say, we're looking at biological change, so change in living things, in populations. So not just in organisms. An organism cannot evolve. Only a population can. And we're looking at how genetics are different. So we're going to be looking at allele and gene frequencies, how common the dominant allele is for a trait in a population, how common the recessive is, that kind of thing. And what we see with evolution is that descendants are different from their ancestors, meaning, you know, frogs in the pond, in the, in the area that you live, are different genetically from their ancestors hundreds of years ago that may have inhabited that same location. So that is what we're looking at here. And we have tons of evidence to support this that I hope you'll see over the different concepts that we cover. There are two overarching categories of evolution. Micro is on a small scale. We're just kind of looking at evolution at a single population, so a group of organisms living in the same place. Whereas macroevolution is large scale, looking at how an entire species um, has evolved over time. That kind of thing. We'll get into patterns of macroevolution in concept two, but for today especially, a lot of what we'll be talking about will be micro. Okay, so I'm not going to go into huge detail on what was believed before. Um, we are doing an activity in class where we'll talk about some of these different um, theories, but I do want to emphasize two things. One is the nature of science, that as we acquire new information, our understanding and more evidence, our understanding changes. And so I do love to point out, though, that one, Charles Darwin did not come up with evolution. All of these different theories, all of these people in italicies, they were all trying to explain something that they saw happening in nature. And so evolution has been talked about for hundreds and hundreds of years. Darwin was just one of the first people to come up with the, the accurate mechanism that we can see in action. Um, a couple other things. A lot of these people are paleontologists and geologists, so they studied the fossil record and they studied the way that um, they studied how like land basically has changed over time, and that's really helped come up with these. Malthus is my favorite because he is the closest. He was the one who had his concept of a struggle for existence is really foundational for what Darwin later came up with. And then the most interesting to me is Lamarck. He came up with the inheritance of acquired traits. And I want to take a second to talk about this because this is what a lot of people think when they think evolution. So what Lamarck said is he said that organisms acquire traits, they evolve through use and disuse. So for example, there are a bunch of giraffes and some giraffes realized that they were all competing for food, you know, at the bottom of the tree. So certain giraffes would stretch their neck and by stretching their neck to reach higher trees, they were able to access more food, live longer, reproduce more, pass on their traits for their stretched out neck to their ancestors or to um, their descendants. So that over time, what we saw is that giraffes evolved to have longer necks in order to survive and compete with you know, smaller mammals for the food source that they had. But here's the problem with that. If I'm working out 24 seven and I have a six pack and then I get pregnant and I have a baby, my baby doesn't come out with a six pack because I ha acquired a six pack. And maybe you're like, well, you were pregnant. Okay, I dye my hair hot pink. I give ha get pregnant, have a baby. My baby will not be born with hot pink hair because my genes do not say hot pink hair and I cannot change my genes. My genes, if you could see me, say brown hair. And so I'm only gonna be passing on brown hair genes to my baby. And so 
that is where this just, his theory just totally falls flat. And again, organisms can't evolve. I can't just decide that my I'm going to dye my hair pink and this is going to and I'm going to pass it on my kids because it's going to help me survive and reproduce better because that's just not how it works because I can't change my genes and this is all genetically based. This is, we're going to tie so much back into what we learned about genetics. Oftentimes it's said that evolution is the unifying theme of biology and I think that's really really true. So. You don't need to write anything for this slide. Just a little bit of background around Darwin, even though we are reading about him in class. He was a naturalist. Um, he went on this voyage to the Galapagos Islands, and it's kind of a crazy story how he ended up there, so I hope you enjoy reading about that when we read the story behind the science in class. But he goes there, and he starts studying. He's no, famous for studying the finches, which is a type of bird, and then the tortoises. And what he saw was he was analyzing how they looked and the traits they had for their specific islands in the Galapagos Islands, and then how those compared kind of to the mainland. And through his observations, he came up with his theory for natural selection as the mechanism for how evolution occurs. Again, Darwin did not invent evolution. He just explained how it happens. So here's what he saw. He saw that left unchecked, the number of organisms in a species will increase. But in nature, populations tend to remain stable. They don't just increase exponentially. And that's because environmental resources are limited. So then what he saw is that individuals in a population, they're not identical. They're all, they all have varying, varying characteristics. No two tortoises are the same. And a lot of this variation is heritable, meaning it's traits that they inherited in their genes. And so he concluded natural selection from this. And here's what natural selection states. Organisms with the best traits, which are adaptations, will live longer and reproduce more than others, causing changes in the population over time by acting on traits that are heritable. Now that sounds fancy, but one of the simple ways to explain it is survival of the fittest. Fitness in biology is a measure of how well you survive in your environment. So if you're really fit, that means you have the traits that you need to survive well in your environment. If you have you are not very fit, you do not have the traits you need to survive in your environment. So for example, if I was to try to live in the ocean, I would have a low fitness. I do not inherently have the traits that would allow me to survive in that environment. I don't have gills. I can't tread water indefinitely. So that is what fitness is. So all this says is that the fittest are going to survive and nature is going to select out those who are not as fit. And so what will happen is if you have better traits, you're going to live longer. If you're living longer, you're going to make more babies. And so you're going to keep passing on your traits, passing on your genes over and over again. So your genes should become more common over time. And thus over time, nature is going to favor a certain set of traits in, again, the population. So all of his observations, he kind of summarized into four principles here that kind of explain how natural selection works. And that's what we'll go through on the next few slides. So first is overproduction of offspring. Lots of offspring and limited resources causes competition for those resources. So like I said, Populations don't just increase in nature indefinitely. They're always, there's always a limit to them. They stay in a stable range, and that's because there's a limited amount of resources. There's not enough food. There's not enough habitats for everyone to survive. And this creates competition for those resources. And because there's competition, that creates a space to say that you are better and you are worse. You are more fit and you are less fit. And that, that differentiation comes because of variation. In every population of organisms, there's variation. There's differences in the physical traits that are there. No population of organisms is made of population of organisms is made of clones. And we get variation from random mutations, genetic recombination during meiosis. Remember back to prophase one and crossing over where the homochromos can swap sections of DNA. That creates new combinations of genes. And then migration, and specifically gene flow. So moving into a new environment and introducing new genes and actually reproducing once you're in that new environment. Now, these second two only apply to sexual reproducers, those that it takes two to tango. Asexual reproducers like bacteria, they're just cloning themselves. So the only way that they get new variation is through random mutations. And so that's why we say that this is the ultimate source. But again, even in those situations, mutations are always happening. So there's always some sort of variation.
And again, if you're listening to me and you're like, I need the evidence, this unit's about the evidence. Today, I'm just going to give you the framework, and then we're going to fill in throughout the unit all sorts of different examples, visuals, activities, real world data. Like you're going to see the evidence that's backing this kind of stuff. Okay, next principle of natural selection is adaptation. So an adaptation is a thing, it's a noun, it's a feature or a trait that allows an organism to better survive in its environment. I can't adapt to my environment. It's not a, we're not thinking this as a verb. It's something you already have because it was in your genes. So you already naturally have this trait and it happens to make you better at surviving than others, thus you're more fit for your environment. So what we should see is beneficial traits or adaptations should become more common over time because organisms should live longer and thus be able to reproduce more with those traits. So for example, think about all the plants and the vegetation in a desert. Once upon a time, there was a lot of variation there as, opposed, as to what lived there. Think about within that variation, there were naturally some plants that had mutations that led to genes that led to phenotypes where they had the ability to retain and store water better than other plants. And so the plants that couldn't do that were dying before they could pass on their genes. And the ones that could retain water and survive in that environment lived longer and reproduced more. So that over a long period of time, what we saw is that the population changed, that the only organisms that were able to live there were the ones that had these adaptations to retain water for long periods of time. Because the gene pool changes. So think of the gene pool as all of the combined alleles of an individual's in the population. So if we have a hundred frogs in a pond that we're analyzing, it would be all of their DNA basically in a pot, and we call that the gene pool. And we can calculate and count how common different genes are by looking at the alleles in that gene pool. And we're gonna do that. We're gonna do some numbers. We're gonna quantify this so that you can see how the numbers work out for this to make sense. Okay, last but not least for principles of selection is descent with modification. So a change in gene frequency over time happens and it leads to populations with new phenotypes adapted to new situations. So certain genes become more common over time than others and these don't come from nowhere. They come from their ancestors. So over time, descendants are modified from their ancestors. Beneficial traits, again, should become more and more common. I cannot say this enough. Individuals do not evolve. Only populations do. We're looking at populations here. Now, in class, this is a long set of notes, y'all. So we're going to spread this out over several days and stop and do activities and hands-on things. But for the sake of the video, I'm going to keep pushing through. So please pause and take breaks and don't try to ingest all this at once. Okay. So next for our next little chunk that I want to talk about are three modes of natural selection. So when we're kind of looking at natural selection and how it changes the frequency distribution of certain traits in an environment, we kind of see three patterns. So frequency, just think how common. Okay, so first, let's say this dotted line is representing a gene frequency in a population. Okay, so the middle, the average trait is the most common. The extreme traits are less common. Directional selection is where over time, the extreme version of a trait is favored. So one side or the other gets favored. So over time, we would start to see it shift to one side on the graph, either this side or this side. That's directional selection. Okay, what do I mean by that? Let's say you're in an environment and you're looking at a population where there's a ton of moths and the majority of them have light colored wings. But maybe there's a mutation and then a dark moth appears and then that dark moth reproduces and dark moths start appearing more in the population because of a mutation that created that variation. Because moths live against tree barks years later, most of the moth, when we're looking at the population, it appears that most of the moths are actually dark. They're not light, light colored. So what we saw was that over time, the darker moths were blending in better, so they were living longer and reproducing more. And so what we start to see is this shift in a different direction, in directional selection to favor a trait that's a different extreme. Okay, here's another example, or another mode, is disruptive. So this is where we're actually going to favor the two extremes and not the average trait. Okay, so let's say we're looking at snakes in a population. 
and in their environment, some of the snakes live on rocks and are gray, and then some live in the grass and are green. But snakes that are maybe in the middle, maybe they have a pattern that makes them gray and green, they have an intermediate and average coloring, they're disadvantaged because they don't blend into the grass or the rocks. So they would be selected out, they would most likely die off before they could keep passing on their traits, and over time we would see gray snakes and we would say green snakes and not really any combination of the two. All right, the third mode of selection is stabilizing. So this is where we just keep favoring the average. And so that just gets even more, um, even more favored. So for example, human babies, there's a rate or excuse me, a range in weights for human babies, babies that are below a certain weight when they're born have a hard time surviving. Babies that are really large cannot get out of the womb and, you know, there can be health issues there too. So there's this average weight that's been favored over time and babies are often born within this certain range have the best chance of survival. Okay. I'm not going to tell you the answers to these because I want you to pause and try. But I want you to read these four situations and try to describe if they're describing directional, disruptive, or stabilizing selection, and then we'll go over them when we're in class together. All right, this is not everyone's favorite thing, but it's really important, so we're going to talk about it, and we're going to get into the math. So every allele in a population, think, remember, dominant alleles or sets of alleles, alleles are just a version of a gene. Every version of a gene has a frequency in the population's gene pool meaning how many times it's showing up in the population. How common is it? 60% of the population have it? 40%? What? How common is it? The higher the frequency, the greater the allele is there, which means the more common it is. It's showing how frequently it's appearing in the gene pool. And remember, gene pool is just the combined alleles of all individuals in a population. And we can calculate these, and this is good. It's good that we can calculate them because then we can look over time and see if these allele frequencies are changing because that's evidence that evolution has occurred, biological change in a population acting on traits that are inheritable. So how do we do this? Lowercase p represents the frequency of the dominant allele in the population, and then lowercase q represents the frequency of the recessive allele. So in a given population with only two versions of a gene, so only two alleles, meaning a dominant version, which is represented by p, and a recessive version represented by Q, then P plus Q equals one. So here's what I mean. We're not looking at blood type or, you know, fur color or something that's really complicated. We're looking at simple traits like purple flowers versus white flowers and pea plants, where there's only two versions of the gene. There's the dominant and the recessive. So what we should see, frequency is just a decimal, but you can easily convert it to a percentage. But it's a decimal, and so it always adds up to one. There's only two options. They got to add up to one. So if 0.4 of the population's p, 0.6 has got to be one. If 0.5 is p, 0.5 has got to be q. Um, I think I misspoke back there, but you get what I'm saying. It has to add up to one. P plus q always has to equal one in a population if there's only two versions of a gene. So we're going to practice calculating this. So let's do an example together. In a population of wildflowers, the red allele is dominant, so we'll use a big R to represent that, and the white allele is recessive, little r. Let's say there's 500 total plants in this population. 20 are white, which is the recessive trait, so they have to be homozygous recessive, little r, little r. 320 are homozygous red, so they're big R, big R, and then 160 are heterozygous red, so they are big R, little r. How many total alleles for flower color are there in this actual population? and how many dominant alleles, and how many recessive alleles. Okay, let's figure it out. First, there are 500 total plants. And remember, every plant has a genotype that's two letters. One allele came from mom, and one came from dad. So there's 1,000 total alleles for flower color in our gene pool. Again, 500 plants, they each have two alleles, that's 1,000 alleles total. Now, let's say I want to figure out how common, common is the little r allele. Well, let's look. There are 20 plants that are little r, little r, meaning in those 20 plants, little r is showing up two times. So 20 plus 20. In these 320 big r, big r plants, that, there's no little r's there, so we don't worry about those 320. 
And then in the heterozygous, there's 160 heterozygous individuals, and they have one little r. So that's 160. So 20 plus 20 plus 160 says there's 200 recessive alleles in this population. Dominant, we're going to do the same thing. So of these 20 that are little r, little r, none of that applies. They don't have a big r. Of these, of these 320, they have two big r, so we have to account for that twice. And then of the 160 that are heterozygous, they all have one big R, so we account for that once. We get 320 plus 320 plus 160 equals 800 alleles. 200 plus 800 equals 1,000, and that's our total. Now, from there, I could have you find the allele frequencies for the dominant and recessive alleles in the population. If I'm asking for an allele frequency, that means I want P and I want Q. Okay, so all you have to do is find part over whole. There's 800 dominant alleles over 1,000 total. That tells me that there's 0.8. That's the frequency of the dominant allele in the population. 200 divided by 1,000, that's where I get 0.2. And remember, you can always double check because P plus Q should always equal 1. 0.8 plus 0.2 equals 1, so we're good. Again, if I ask for the frequency, I want a decimal. If I ask for the percentage of how common they are, you would just multiply these by 100. So it'd be 80% of the, pop, the gene pool has a dominant R, you know, 80, 20% of the gene pool has a recessive little r. Okay, another example, because I know this is a lot. I'm not going to do this one with you and give you the answers, but I want you to work through this, and then we'll go over it as a class. P plants, we're looking at tall allele. You're either tall or short. There's your totals. I want you to walk through the exact same process we just did, find the total alleles first, how many of each, that's a number, and then find the allele frequencies, so P and Q. Now, from there, I then want you to also find the genotype frequencies. So how common is it to be little t, little t, big t, big t, and big t, little t? Try that, see what you can come up with, and then we'll go over it, I promise. Okay. Now, in class, we're going to pause and practice this, but for the sake of the end of the video, I'm going to keep trucking. I know this is getting long, but we're about halfway there. So I want to talk to you about some mechanisms of microevolution. Remember, microevolution is evolution on a small scale, just looking at like one population. There's five things that kind of drive microevolution. Mutations, natural selection, genetic drift, gene flow, and non-random mating. We've already talked about the first two. A good bit, but I'm going to just kind of hit the highlights on that again, and then we'll dive deeper into these other three. So first, mutations, I told you, are the ultimate source of variation. They drive microevolution because a mutation, if you remember, is any change in a DNA sequence, and they create new genotypes and thus new phenotypes, so they're introducing variation to a population. They're, a mutation changes the allele frequency in a population. Remember, how common the allele is in the gene pool. And as there's an increase in variation, it's going to just keep driving evolution because it's going to create these differences that then can be chosen as favored for an adaptation or not. Remember, mutations can be harmful, they can be beneficial, or they could be neutral. They could make no difference to the actual survival or health of the organism. Okay, another mechanism of microevolution is, of course, natural selection, where organisms more fit for their environments will survive and reproduce more. So they're going to have more offspring. And so what we should see is beneficial traits, which are adaptations, will become more common over time. Here's a little picture of some of Darwin's finches he studied and how they were specifically had adaptations for their unique environments on the islands they lived on. And that's what really provided a lot of evidence for natural selection. That nature, the environment they lived in, selected which organisms would live longer and reproduce more. And then over time in those populations, we saw certain traits become more common. Now, some new things. Genetic drift is a mechanism of microevolution. It's just, it's just a random change in the frequency of alleles in a population over time. And I have a little demo I'll show you in class on this. But basically, something random just happens and things change. And what we tend to see in this case is rare alleles will decrease in frequency and others will increase. And tend to see in this also that there's a loss of genetic variation because of bunch of variation basically gets wiped out. And the changes may be more apparent in smaller populations. So the smaller the populations, a population is, the greater the impact genetic drift could have on them. So for example, 
let's say we're looking at a population of roses. And in this population, 80% are red and 20% are white. Well, let's say something happens. You know, there's some sort of environmental catastrophe. We call this population bottleneck, where there's an, something that happens and only a certain amount are able to survive and reproduce. So let's say there's a bottleneck or population bottleneck effect. Only these three organisms are able to reproduce. So the next generation is 70% red and 30% white. Well, you know, there's some other environmental event where, you know, a tree falls and knocks out the food source of all these different flowers and only these three can reproduce. And then the next generation, we see that they're all red. There's a loss of genetic variation because only a certain amount of the population was able to reproduce and pass on their traits. We see this also too, something called the founder effect. So this is where like a small group of organisms in a population will isolate themselves and only reproduce with each other. And it can cause a really big decrease in genetic variation. Um, we see this in the Amish population in um, North America. And I think other, it's in other countries too, but essentially where a, a group of people isolate themselves and they only reproduce within themselves, within their group. And so there, there's a, such a limit to how much variation is in that population. But evolution is still occurring if the overall population's gene frequencies is changing. Now, another thing that drives microevolution is gene flow. Gene flow is the movement of genes into and out of a population. It occurs during migration. It's basically moving and reproducing. So there has to be, there has to be an exchanging of genetic information for this to, happen, to have an impact on evolution. But it causes an increase in genetic variation in the population over time. So let's say I live on an island. And let's say on the island I live on, it's only yellow beetles. But I can take a boat and I can go fish. On, there's a bunch of surrounding little islands around the island I live on. And let's say I take a boat to a different island and it's all blue beetles. I spend the day there fishing. While I'm fishing, a bunch of the blue beetles on that island migrate or walk onto my boat. And then when I come back to my homeland island, they might walk off. And then they start reproducing with all the yellow beetles. That's migration and that's gene flow. That's introducing new traits to the environment. Okay, last mechanism, microevolution, which is my favorite. It is so fascinating, and we'll watch a great video on this together in class. But it is sexual selection, which is also known as non-random mating. And this is where traits get favored or selected that actually don't help your survival. They may even hinder it. But without them, you can't pass on your genes at all because you can't reproduce. So you've got to have these traits in order to be able to reproduce. And when I, the best example of this are male peacocks. So if you didn't know this, the brown peacocks at the zoo, those are the females. And the beautiful blue and green ones are the males. And the males have evolved over time so that they have these beautiful displays of feathers in order to attract the females to get them to reproduce with them. Same with this long-tailed widow bird. They have these, the males have these crazy long tails that actually hinder their ability to fly away um, from their predators but they need them in order to attract the females. And it's really, really fascinating. So it's basically, instead of survival being favored, sex is favored. And those traits that benefit you sexually are what are going to become more common over time because you're going to reproduce more and pass them on more. All right. You've made it to the final stage of our notes. I know this is a doozy. This is truly the longest set of notes we'll ever have. Genetic equilibrium. So some of you are listening to this and you're like, you can't even prove to me that this evolution even happens. Why do we need to listen? We can prove it mathematically because of something called genetic equilibrium. Also known as Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium because of the two that came up with it. Genetic equilibrium, equilibrium would be when we would look at a population and there would be no changes in the allele frequencies in that population over time. So if the allele frequencies, P and Q, are not changing, then the population is in genetic equilibrium, and evolution, evolution then is not happening. Now, the only way for this to happen is the following. The population has to be very large so that genetic drift can occur, so that some random environmental situation can't just wipe out half the population and cause genetic drift. So you need a very large population. There has to be random mating. There can be no sexual selection whatsoever because that causes microevolution. 
So no favoring of traits based on who you want to mate with. There can be no migration because that introduces new genes that causes variation and variation drives natural selection. There can be no mutations because mutations, again, introduce new traits, which causes natural selection. And then, of course, there can be no natural selection. So there has to be enough resources that there is no competition for those resources so that no one can be favored as better at surviving than others. If even one of these conditions is not met, then the population is evolving. And we can prove this mathematically. And that's HWE, Hardy-Weinberg Equilibrium. So we already know that in all populations with only two possible alleles, dominant and recessive for a gene, P plus Q equals one. So the frequency of the dominant allele plus the frequency of the recessive allele equals one. And this allows us to calculate allele frequencies for P and Q, and then we can calculate genotype frequencies like we did in that second example. But here's the deal. When a population is in HWE, it's in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium or genetic equilibrium, there's another equation we can use to calculate the frequency of genotypes in that population. And it's P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. P squared represents the genotypic frequency of the homozygous dominant individuals. So everyone that's big R, big R in the population. 2PQ is the genotypic frequency of the heterozygous individuals, and Q squared is the homozygous recessive. And so this is an equation we can use to calculate how common different genotypes are in a population only if we know the population is in Hardy-Weinberg. Now, why is this nice? Because we can take actual numbers and compare them to predicted numbers and of what it would, the, gene, the frequency should look like if we're in genetic equilibrium. And if those are different, that shows that the population is evolving. If they're the same, it shows that it is in genetic equilibrium and the population is not evolving. So let's do some examples because I think that'll help us understand this a little better. I'm going to do two examples with you and then there'll be some practice for you to do that we'll go over in class together. So round heads are dominant to cone heads and 51% of the individuals in a population have round heads per se. What portion of this 51% are homozygous? So again, 51% have round, that's dominant. So we're looking for what percent are big R, big R. And let's say the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So 51%, first we got to convert it to a frequency so we can actually use it in our equations. So just divide by 100 and that gives you 0.51. So that's how many show the dominant trait, which means they're either big R, big R, or big R, little r. That's not super helpful for us because we don't know within there what's which is which. But if 51% are dominant and showing the dominant trait of round, that means 49% are showing the recessive trait or 0.49, which is cone. And if you show a recessive trait, we know your genotype is little r, little r. So we know that 0.49 then equals Q squared. Because remember, Q squared is my genotypic frequency of, of homozygous recessive. So we can set that equal to Q squared, and then now what can we find? We can find Q, which is the recessive allele frequency. So take the square root of 0.49, and that's 0.7. And remember, P plus Q always equals 1. So if Q is 0.7, that means P is 0.3. From there, to find what, you know, the proportion of the population that's um, homozygous, that's big R, big R, which is P squared. So P, if P is 0.3, we're going to square that, and that gives us 0.09 as the frequency or 9% if we change that to present of the population is in is homozygous recessive. Excuse me, homozygous dominant. Goodness gracious, sorry I'm misspeaking because this is such a long video. Okay, let's do another example. In turtles, let's say red color is dominant to yellow. In a population of 241 turtles, 34 are yellow. Let's assume the population is in Hardy-Weinberg, which means we can use that P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equation. What are the allele frequencies? So anytime I'm asking for allele frequencies, I'm asking for P and Q. And then what percentage of each genotype is in the population? So we want to know the genotypic frequencies as well, and we'll convert those to percentages. So what are the allele frequencies? Okay, big R is red, little r is yellow. So remember... The yellow, the recessive trait is what really matters because we know your genotype if you show a recessive phenotype. So 34 out of 241, let's find that frequency. That means 0.14. That's the yellow phenotype frequency, which is equal to the little r, little r genotype frequency, which is Q squared. Okay, now take the square root. 
and we get just Q. To find P, we'll do P plus Q equals 1. So 1 minus 0.37, and we get 0.63 for our P. Those are my allele frequencies. From there, you can find anything. So each genotype, big R, big R is P squared. Plug in 0.63, you get 0.3969. It wants the percent, though, so I'm going to convert that to a percent. Big R, little r is 2PQ. Plug and chug. There you go. And then little r, little r as well, which we already know. And that's where you get those final answers. Okay, so here's some practice. I'm not going to show you the answers, but I want you to work through this practice problem and see how you can do with it. Okay. And I'm going to go fast because I don't want to, I want you to really pause and try on this. Oh, okay, this is a different one. This one's a little bit harder, so actually I'm going to talk to you about this one. Okay. Another problem. Let's say I tell you the information, this information about the turtles. And then I want to know what percent of each. Okay, so let's start there. 27 are bigger, bigger. We just do 27 divided by 2.4. We get 0.11. 11% of the population is bigger, bigger. For heterozygous, we'll do 200 divided by 241. We get 0.83. That's 83% are hetero. Little r, little r, take 14 divided by 241. We get 0.06, which converts to 6%. Little r, little r. Okay, from there. This is the percentage of the, uh, the genotype frequencies in the actual genotype percentages in the actual population. So what are the allele frequencies? Well, that's P and Q. So I don't know if this population is in Hardy-Weinberg, so I can't just use like P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared. I'll have to do what we did originally at the beginning of the notes, which is look at the totals and the parts. So there's 480 total alleles because 241 times 2 each is 482. And then I gotta add up. Big R shows up once in the 200, twice in the 27. I get 284. 254 divided by 42 gives me 0.53. Little R shows up twice in the 14ers, and then once in the 200. And that's where I get 228. All right, that's my allele frequencies. Now, from there, is the population in Hardy Weinberg? Well, let's take P and Q, plug into the Hardy Weinberg equation, and then compare it to what we saw the actual numbers to be and see if they the, they're the same. So for P, we said 0.53 square it, that gives you 0 0.2809. This does not equal 0 0.11, which is what we predicted from part A. There's, we plug in for headers, I guess, we get 0.4982. That is not equal what the actual population was, which was 0.83. And then we do the same here and it is not. So since they do not match part D, the population is not in Hardy-Weinberg because the actual genotype frequencies from part A do not match what we predicted here. Therefore, the population is evolving. And what's being favored? Well, this is what, if evolution wasn't happening, these bigger numbers are what we should see. But instead, we see these italicized numbers. So we see that the heterozygous is what's being favored because it's higher and the other two are lower than what we predicted. So stabilizing selection is what's occurring. Now, if you're totally overwhelmed, here are some strategies to attack these kinds of problems. First, if the population is in HWE, if they tell you to assume it's in genetic equilibrium, and you're given the phenotypes, first find homozygous recessive genotype, that, and that's set that equal to Q squared. From there, get your, take the square root to get Q, and then find P using P plus Q equals 1. Then, since in Hardy-Weinberg, you can use this equation to find the other genotype frequencies or whatever else it asks you for. Now, if you're trying to figure out if a population is an HWE and you're not sure, like in our last practice problem, first you're going to need to use the actual numbers, like where you have to add them up and then divide by the total, to calculate genotype and allele frequencies. That's what we did in um, practice number two just now. I'll change that. I should say practice number two. Once you have P and Q, you're going to use your Hardy-Weinberg equation to find the genotype frequencies of the population if we knew it were an HWE. Then you're going to compare these. If they match up, the population's in HWE. If they don't match up to the actual numbers you calculated, then the population is not, and it must be evolving, and you can figure out what, what is being favored. And you've officially survived the longest notes ever of the whole year. Way to go.